All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. I am thrilled to uh, to be here. How about you? Amen. Yeah, it's really been a blessing. I, I enjoyed the, the women's panel as well, um, even though I'm not a woman. But I really, uh, I really appreciated uh, many of the points that were shared. And we can learn from each other, can't we? Amen. Yes. We can yes. learn, and I, I believe that God wants us to have heaven that begins right here on earth. Right. The faster we accept God's method, the faster that becomes a reality. Yes. So, yes. I'm thankful for the mothers in Israel, the sisters in Israel, and uh, as we begin. Um, I'm, I'm going to be kind of selective with what I, I share, um, but why don't we pray, if you'll allow me, uh, that the Lord will, will lead in time. So, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I thank you so much, Lord, for your leading your guidance, and how you relentlessly pursue us with your love. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you haven't given up on me, and I ask that as we talk this evening that Christ will be lifted up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> My parents are from India. If you couldn't tell, or if you're wondering why I look like this, it's because my parents are from India. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was born and raised in the United States, in, uh, in Maryland, Washington, D.C. area. And, um, and I believe, you know, our, our theme is for the camp life. Unto every man gave his word. And I believe that God has a special place for each one. Yeah. And I believe that Satan is threatened by the idea that any of you or any of us will ever find out what that is. <coughs> because if you can be in the right place that God wants you to be in, Satan's kingdom is in jeopardy. Isn't that right? And I don't say that because God has made me into, you know, not because I'm a great anything, I'm a mess. I'm thankful for a Messiah. Right? Um, my, my father was Seventh-day Adventist. My mother was a Catholic in India uh, before they knew each other. Uh, my grandfather, matter of fact, was a Seventh-day Adventist. He, um, when, when the missionaries came to India, my grandfather accepted the message, he was baptized, and he was an, an educator. So when uh, people refer to Dr. Sukumar, they're never talking about me, they're always talking about my grandfather, right? <laughs> and he is a, or he was, um, he was an educator and a minister as well. And so the missionaries put my, my grandfather in charge of the Adventist schools at the time, which were very few, still are very few in India. And um, I, I won't name them right now, but uh, of course, naturally, when you're a Seventh-day Adventist minister in a predominantly Hindu and Muslim country with all kinds of other flavors of religion, Naturally, you, you develop some, you make some enemies, right? And so, uh, uh, my, my grandfather, he, he was no perfect man. He certainly had his, his issues, uh, but he was a praying man. And I'm thankful for that, uh, because, well, you'll see. Uh, so, so here's my, my grandfather who is in charge of these, these schools, and, and one day, um, I'm going to try to be vague with some of these because I don't want, if somebody sees this one day, I don't want them to know who I'm talking about. But 
um, there was an individual who went to, for lack of better terms, the witch doctor. Let's call him that. And they wanted to commission a demon to go and kill my grandfather. And so, uh, my grandfather, one day, he was going into his office at the school, and he, he, as soon as he steps on the step going into his office, he suddenly felt sick and dizzy and this and that, and, and of course, I said my grandfather was a praying man, right? The first thing he did was, guess what? He dropped to his knees and he starts praying. And he's praying and praying and, and as he's praying, he suddenly hears a whip crack next to his head. You know, right? He suddenly hears a whip crack and he startles him and he opens his eyes, looks around, there's no one there. My grandfather didn't know what happened. Years later though, we found out from someone who knew someone who knew the person who sent him or something like that. That's why I'm being really vague, because I don't, you know, don't want to, don't want any, uh, you know, feeling signaled out here. So, um, we found out later on that this person had commissioned a demon to go kill my grandfather, and, and, and you want to hear the testimony of a demon? I know, it, it sounds like a weird thing to say, but the Bible has them too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. The Bible has the, the, the words of a demon, uh, Jesus I know, who knows the rest of it? Why? I know, but Why? Uh, the testimony of a demon, right? So here's this, what we found out, this demon was going to execute my grandfather, and as he goes, this is what the demon said, that a light encapsulated him, and he was not permitted to touch it. That demon went back to the person who sent him, and that person vomited blood and died. The Lord protects his people. Amen. Yes. Amen. I'm not happy about what happened to the individual. And I wish that story turned out differently for them. That's my grandfather, right? I can tell you all kinds of stories about him. He's quite a well-known person <clears throat> amongst the Indian Adventist community because most Indian Adventists in their, let's say, 50s, 60s probably studied under my grandfather in those schools, right? Um, so I have lots of stories about him, but we, we got to get to our, our theme, right? <laughs> Moving forward, my dad, 18 years old, comes to this country and um, remember, the Lord protects his people, right? Amen. Why? Because he has a work for him to do. So my dad, 18 years old, comes to this country, ready to live the American dream. He was a musician, he wanted to get recorded, and he had all kinds of contacts with different people who could have put him in contact with all these famous people. And anyway, um, my dad's life trajectory was moving away from the church and getting further steeped into the world. One day there was a, an incident that happened. Um, my, my dad was a passenger in, in the front seat of a vehicle that his, uh, one of his family members were driving, let's put it that way. And, uh, and they turned into the road without seeing that there was a truck coming. And uh, they got t you know what that means, right? They got hit on the side, on his side, on the passenger side of the vehicle. And he got, he got hit so hard that my, my dad was, uh, and, and in this situation back then, you didn't have to wear seat belts and all that stuff. And so he wasn't wearing a seat belt, and the Lord used that to actually spare his life because the car got crushed entirely. But because he wasn't wearing a seat belt, he actually got pushed out of the way of what would have been crushed, and instead he went through the windshield. And so, uh, of course, he, he had all kinds of things that happened because of that. His face was, was uh, messed up, they thought he was brain dead, so they sewed him up without giving him any an anesthetic, so they thought he, he thought he would have a traumatic brain injury, so he had to watch them. So, sorry, I don't want to give too much detail, but it, it was, my, my dad had to have multiple plastic surgeries to reconstruct his face. So, some of you have met my dad, right? I know the children's have, I know the family in the back has, I know. Did you buy that theater? You'll meet up one day. <laughs> so, um, 
And so he, he had multiple plastic surgeries to reconstruct his face and all these things. And, and it was pretty bad. He was in the hospital for a while. But that day, before the ambulance got there, before the police got there, before the fire department got there, the eyewitnesses that were around told the first responders that they got there, when, they, when they got there that there were these two men dressed in white who ran to the car. I, I can't say this without crying, I'm sorry. That's all right. That's all right. Sorry, I can't do crying. That's all right. It's okay to cry. Tears is a language that God understands. Two men dressed in white yeah. ran to the car and bandaged my father's wounds. Amen. 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 And my dad didn't believe it. <laughs> He's in the hospital. He heard about this. I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, there were these two guys who ran to the car, bandaged his wounds, and when, when, the, when the first responders came, they kind of just disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to them. Mm -hmm. My dad didn't believe it. He had to go and see for himself. And so later on, his uncle took him to the wreck. They found the car at the, wherever it was, junkyard or whatever. And sure enough, the white rags soaked in my dad's blood. Sitting there. The what? Sorry. White rags <laughs> soaked in my father's blood. Oh. Wow. Does God know how to take care of his people? Amen. <laughs> and he does so because he has a work for him to do. It's a work for you to do. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Let's actually look at this. Let's look at this. Yeah, that's right. Um, let my Bible tell you use this thing. Let me use this thing. Um, do you have your Bibles with you? Yeah. Anyone have a Bible? Or if you have a thing, you can use it. Uh, let's turn to... Let's see, what is that? Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to look at verse 10. <laughs> oh, did you? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. You have it? Alright, here we go. Finally, my brethren, be what? Strong. Strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Put on how much of it? The whole armor. Not half of it. Not one piece of it. We're counseled to put on the whole armor of God. For what reason? That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wicked, wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And that's not just for me, that's for you, that's for every person on the planet. That's what this, this council is for all of us. And, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about what the armor is. Right? So, so that's my dad, and that, 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 that incident kind of changed the direction of his life, let's put it that way. You know? um, later on, my dad was introduced to my mom. I think my time's up. Well. <laughs> My dad was introduced to my mom uh, over the phone. My mom was in India, my dad was in the United States. Um, long story short, my mom uh, eventually did Bible studies and she became a Seventh-day Adventist and they both got married. Uh, my, my, my dad brought her here and uh, they were married. And uh, a year or two later, Anyway, I arrived. 
And they, they decided to, to, to call my name Ashwin. Um, I don't know where they got that idea from. Um, but you would think it's an Indian name, but it's actually not. <laughs> well, it, it probably is as well, but that's not what they intended. Uh, Ashwin actually is a Thai name. And you know what it means? Here's what it means. That's how you write it. Actually, I had a, there was a lady who I met in Thailand. She wrote up. She wrote up a name for me. So, by faith, I believe that that's what my name looks like in Thailand. I have no idea, but I'm hoping so. So, what my name means is brave knight with a cane or hero. And that's always been significant for me growing up, not because I'm, you know, I, I hope you don't get the idea, I'm not trying to look at myself here. But it's been significant for me because name in the Bible often refers to character. your what? Character, right? And so all through my life, knowing that my parents used to tell me this one as a child, we named you to be a hero. And so in, in all through my life, I've always had this, this, um, I don't know, there's always been this underlying thing all through my life that I must always strive to be a hero. In everything I do, I want to strive to be a hero. Um, and so, whatever that means, it just felt like that was my calling in life. That God wanted me to do this, that I was supposed to be this somehow. So, my, my dad, um, he was, uh, you know, like I said, he was kind of in... He grew up in the church, but he was kind of, you know, experimenting in the world. And then here's my mom coming from Catholicism, and she's very new at all of this stuff. And so through my lifetime, they were learning. They were learning, they were experimenting uh, with different things. And we attended a, a Seventh-day Adventist church, uh, which will also go unnamed. And, um, and, and, and God was good. My parents, they really... I can honestly say uh, I'm so thankful to God for my parents. Um, they were not perfect, but they tried their best. And I, I always knew that, my sister and I always knew that that our parents, they, yes, they, they, we, we could see that they were not perfect, but we can also see that they sincerely wanted to do what's right. And they always provided for us, made sure we had what we needed, not always what we wanted, but what we needed, you know. And. Um, and, and one of the things that they wanted to do was to, to have a, a, a spiritual environment in the home. And, uh, of course, so through my lifetime they were learning, so they didn't really know what that was. So, uh, we went to a church, an Adventist church, that, I don't know how to describe it except for lukewarm. Um, I never heard Bible prophecy or anything like that until I was a teenager. I mean, we, we would, you know, you would hear about it maybe in Sabbath school or something, but... It wasn't something that was preached from the pulpit. It was not something that uh, that we understood to be important. Um, you know, it was very common knowledge that the elders or deacons were, uh, you know, would drink alcohol and go clubbing and different things. And so it was a very secular, a very secular uh, church environment. I'll say it that way. I'm trying to be, you know, kind here. And um, and so for me. Growing up in the Adventist church was nothing more than a social club. Let's put it that way. It wasn't a it wasn't a, a deep religious experience. Although I I do remember you know learning some things and actually you know trying to have a, somewhat of a devotional life. There, you know the Lord's so so blessed, but uh, despite but there were some some serious issues. And so my my view of the church was not not so good. Um, because, like I said, it was deeply secular. And, uh, and I mean secular, meaning like in the church, you know, or in the fellowship hall, they would have basketball tournaments and playing rap music with all the cuss words in there and everything. I mean, it was, it was ugly. It wasn't, it wasn't really, I, I wouldn't say these are things that are becoming a spiritual life. And, um, and so my parents are, are, you know, they're searching and they're wanting to, to do better for their kids. And, and so they start, um, you know, we kind of went church hopping for a while, you know, to try to find, uh, you know, whatever they were looking for in that, in that spiritual experience. 
And, um, and, and in the process of that, I remember one day they, they met this, this, um, this Indian couple, which of course my parents would, would buy with because they're Indian, right? So they met this Indian couple, and this couple, the, the, the wife was wearing this long skirt, and the, the husband you know, was dressed very neatly, and his hair very tidy, and, and they said, praise the Lord every other sentence, and it was, I'm serious, that's, as a child I was like, wow, these people really say that phrase a lot, you know? <laughs> Uh, for things that I didn't, I was like, why would you say that? Anyway, so, and uh, like, like, you know, they would say, uh, you know, okay, I'm going to have to praise the Lord, but, you know, I'm like, why would you say that? And, and I'm, not, I'm not making light of, you understand, I'm not making light of, of, of that actual phrase, but that's really what, I thought it was ridiculous to, to say it something like that. Anyway, um, these people were, were deeply spiritual, they would have these prayer meetings, and, and so they invited my parents to come over to their, to their house, and I remember, um, you know, as a child, I hated that because I'm like, man, we have to go and wait for these people to pray for the next four hours, and they're like, you know, they're they're praying, and they're, and then I noticed some strange things. They're like chanting, and they're like repeating things often, and I'm like, wait a minute. They were not Seventh Day Adventists; they were Pentecostal. And um, but my parents were soaking it up. They're like, wow, these people are deeply spiritual. Uh, maybe this is good for us, right? And so they were attending all these prayer meetings, and uh, yeah, I just hate those. But um, but one day, uh, I remember this couple told told my uh, my parents that um, they said, "Hey, brother, sister, uh, we know this, this 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 preacher, and he he has the Holy Spirit. You should invite him into your home because since, <coughs> since you're looking uh, to." up your spiritual experience. And, and so I remember they, they called this guy and he's, he's, he was a, a Pentecostal evangelist somewhere in India. And this was before Google. This is before you could, you know, before smartphones and you, you didn't really, there was no way of knowing, like information now is completely different from then, right? Mm -hmm. And so they pick up the phone and they're talking to this guy and, and he was telling us all the articles of furniture in our house as if he could see it. And we know he's never seen it before. So um, so my parents were like, wow, that's kind of creepy, but also maybe that's the Holy Spirit. So, so they invited him to come to our house. And, uh, so I remember this, this man coming to our house and then um, started having prayer meetings there. And different people would come even Adventists would come, people would come into the house for prayer meeting and, and it became a bedlam of noise very quickly. <laughs> you know, they would, they would, I remember they, the favorite song was Power in the Blood, right? Mm. Um, but there would be people, even Adventists, becoming demon possessed in, in our home and falling on the ground and they did the whole, you know, slain in the spirit thing. <laughs> you know, he, he did it to my dad once and it didn't work. It was kind of <laughs> But anyway, so um, now, now the Lord loved my family, even though we were on the wrong pathway. I'm so thankful for that. I don't know if any of you have Amen. ever heard the testimony of Stephen Smith. Anyone know the testimony of Stephen Smith? He was a during he was a critic of Ellen White in her day, and and he was so bitterly critical of her and. And I remember reading that story about how he, you know, Ellen White uh, wrote a testimony mm -hmm. that, that remained unread mm -hmm. for was it 27 years or something. Yeah. And then he, he opened it later. And anyway, long story short, he came, he, he came to the Lord and all of that. But I love the, the story I was reading. It said that while he was, he was bitter in all of his stuff, and then after that said, now the Lord loves Stephen Smith. <laughs> and I, I, I kind of feel that we, we were on the wrong pathway, but I can say, the Lord loved the Sukumaran family. Mm -hmm. And he had a work for us too. <laughs> and so, um, so one night my dad had a dream. And um, have I told this before? Has anyone, has anyone heard this before? No. Okay, all right. Um, so so one, night, one night my dad <clears throat> had a dream and in this dream, he was, he was trapped in this room. And there's a monkey in the room. Now, you may think that's silly, 
But to an Indian person, a monkey is threatening. They're like, they're, 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 they're vicious creatures that will bite you and bully you and steal your stuff. So anyway, so he sees this, he's trapped in this room and there's this monkey and this monkey is like able to reach anywhere in the room. By the way, oh yeah, that's right that way. So, uh, and my dad was kind of, kind of scared of this thing and, and, and then he heard a voice in his dream said, that said, this is a deceiving spirit. And he looked again at the monkey and he saw the face of the monkey and it was the face of the man staying in our house. And he heard the voice again, this is a deceiving spirit. Um, now, the whole reaching out thing, it was interesting because when, when, when they were on the phone with my, with my parents, when that evangelist was on the phone with my parents, he would say, I can reach you anywhere you are in the world. And to demonstrate that, he was telling my parents where everything was in our house, which was really creepy. Um, and so anyway, my, my dad was a bit disturbed by that dream. He tells my mom they're kind of disturbed and then and they're discussing amongst themselves and it was, I think it was breakfast the next day or lunch, I can't remember. And the, this, this evangelist um, looked at my dad and said, brother, something's bothering you, what is it? My dad tells him the dream, right? So my dad says, well, you know, brother, uh, I had a dream. Oh, tell me the dream. The Lord sometimes speaks to us through the dreams. Right? Dad tells the dream, he says, you know, I, I saw this monkey and it could reach all over and, and I was trapped in the room with it. And then he interrupts my dad and says, Brother, that is a deceiving spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and then my dad knew at that moment, this man had to go. <laughs> um, and, and there were other things going on. There were spiritual manifestations in our house. I would hear, even for me, uh, as a child, like, the whole time he was in our house, I would have nightmares about this grotesque things I've never seen before. Um, and uh, we would hear voices speaking in our house, just all kinds of spiritualistic things. Again, we wrestled not against, and yeah, there was a spiritual battle in our house. And um, God had a work for me to do. Amen. Amen. And he, uh, yeah. That was a that was a tough experience for my parents. Bitterly disappointed in what they thought was going to be a better spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, later on, Ron Halverson Sr. came to town. Anyone know who that is? Mm -hmm. yes. Ron Halverson Sr. Well, he came. His right. nephew was a pastor. So. <clears throat> What's that? His nephew was a pastor. Oh so. really? Very cool. Yeah. So um, so Ron Halverson came to town. And, and uh, long story short, my, my parents and myself were, were baptized in, in Tacoma Park in Maryland. And um, as, as a result of those meetings, and you know, there was other things as well, but I was like, this and that. I was very young at that time. And from that point onwards, you know, my parents, they definitely studied more. They read the scriptures more. Not so much of the spirit of prophecy. I remember my dad reading really the the great controversy for the first time, and you know, and he was excited about it and learning. And, you know, I was excited about it. Not, not really excited, but just doing my thing. Now, now that's on the spiritual front. Now there's there's the other side of things, which is the day-to-day -day living, right? Um, so I went to the public school system all my life. I've never been to. I've never had home, you know, homeschooling or Adventist education of any sort. And um, I remember uh, I, I I hated my life, and I'll say this: I you know I went I was in a we were in a neighborhood that wasn't wasn't the best. Um, you know, we've had the area where we lived. We had multiple people murdered right in front of our house. You know, like gang activity and drugs and things like that. That was. Well, I, I don't talk, <laughs> if you heard me how I talked maybe 15 years ago, uh, you wouldn't have recognized me at all. I had a very different way of talking, and different way of dressing, different way of walking. And uh, God has been good to me. But I, I kind of did what everyone else did around, not because I thought it was cool, actually I thought it was stupid. But the reason why I did it was because it was my camouflage. 
You know, is that why I say camouflage? Yeah. So I, I, I got, um, you know, throughout school, I got bullied a lot, being because I looked different or whatever it was. Um, and so I, I just hated going to school. I remember telling my dad once about, like, you know, this person did something, whatever, to me. And, and, um, and, and I guess he didn't really, he didn't take it seriously. Not that he, you know, he wasn't a bad dad. He just, that particular thing, I guess he didn't understand how serious it was to me, you know. Um, and so I just kind of felt like I was on my own. I just had to face the wild every day, <laughs> you know. Um, so I, I got picked on a lot. I did not enjoy school. S school academically was not difficult for me, but I had zero motivation to do anything right. And so I got very poor grades through school. Um, because I had no motivation to do anything. And, and I, hated, I hated the fact that I had to wake up early, catch the bus, go to school, to do all of this, and then they give me homework. <laughs> no, I thought the point of going to school was to learn at school. But now you have to take school home with you, and I never understood that. And so, yeah, I thought, why was this homework? So then I had to go home, so I'm like, the one little bit of life that I like, now their school is tainting that. And then, um, and then I, I, I hated Fridays. Well, I kind of liked Fridays because that meant, you know, there's no school for, for a little bit. But I, I also didn't like it on one hand because Friday meant that Sabbath's coming. Mm -hmm. And Sabbath means no TV, which was my release from reality. Mm -hmm. you know? We didn't know at, at that time, you know, we didn't understand the whole Sabbath message. Was. I mean, we, we kept the Sabbath, you know. We didn't buy things on Sabbath. We went to church on Sabbath. You know, we refrained from watching TV and other things on Sabbath. But it's not something I look forward to. I didn't, I didn't understand the depth of what Sabbath was. I'm thankful for it now. I look forward to it every day. <laughs> but uh, at that time, I really, I really didn't know. And so, um, anyway, I, I didn't like looking forward to Sabbath. I love Saturday night. That was my favorite part. And my cousins and I used to chop down the minutes till sundown with the TV remote in our hand <laughs> and turn it on as soon as the as soon as the not when the sun went down when the clock said it was sunset right <laughs> and then and that was our you know thing and we played and whatever and I hated Sundays I hated Sunday because that meant Monday was coming so I just felt miserable all the time uh, long story short. I knew that, that was kind of my life all throughout, from when I was in elementary all the way through middle school, all the way through high school, and I just, I just felt like there was no purpose to my life. Then it came to college. My options were college or military, right? And so I was like, oh, maybe I'll do both. Let's see. Yeah. Um, I, I went to, uh, to to this anyway. Particular college, and God was good to me, and I actually ended up getting a full scholarship. And not because I did good in school, but because those individuals, they, I don't know, they believed in me. These are not Christians or Adventists or anything, but they just really believed in me. And I, I just appreciate that, even, even though that's not, you know, you may not think of it as a high spiritual point, and, you know, we believe in and true education, all these things, but it really meant something to me that as a young person that somebody believed in me. And I'll tell you what, I didn't I never got straight A's when I was in elementary, middle school, or high school, but I got straight A's doing electrical engineering. How is that? I'm just saying not because not because this is all working right, but I believe that as a young man I responded well to to that, that kind of Thing, you know, somebody really believed in me. And the Lord blessed. You know, the Lord blessed. So when I was getting to college, I, I, I really, it was, uh, oh boy, I have four minutes. Okay. So <laughs> as I was getting into, if you want to eat, that's fine too. Um, I, I, I had this, um, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do because I felt that life was so pointless, right? Little did I know that God had work for me to do. That's right. 
And so I, I went, you know, I, I just kind of picked something because I thought it would make a lot of money probably. So I said, well, let me just pick this degree and I'll go into it and, and I'm going to make a lot of money and then, and then I'll just, that way I can finally be done with school. <laughs> and I can, I can live life on my own terms, right? And then I, I remember seeing an interview with this guy. I don't know if any of you know who that is. Yeah. You know who that is? Yeah. Carrie. Yeah, Jim Carrey. Yeah. Right. I'm not, I'm not promoting any of his movies or anything, but I, I remember seeing an interview from him, and, and he said this thing which kind of blew my mind. He said, I hope everybody can get rich and famous and will have everything they ever dreamed of so they'll know that it's not the answer. And I was like, oh, that's kind of a weird thing to say, because this is the guy who makes America laugh, and he has all the money, and you would think that if he has all the money, he can do whatever he wants, and he can live his happy life, right? And so I, I, um, I, I started analyzing things in my mind. All right, you, I have to go to the school no matter how much I hate it because I have to get into the right college, right? You got to go to school to get the right grades so you can get into the right college. Now, once you get into the right college, you got to get the right degree and get the right GPA so that you can get the right yeah. job. And, and then when you get the right job, you got to, you know, you, you want to get the right job so you can get the right pay, right? And get the right status in society. Because if you have the right pay, then you can do what you want, right? That's what the world taught. This is teaching currently. And, uh, but of course, I bought into this. So if you get the right amount of money, then you can do what you want. Then you get the right car, you get the right house and the right spouse and the right blouse, whatever you want, right? <laughs> Everything that you could ever want. Mm. It's attached to money, right? And, uh, yeah. And during that time, right around the time when I was in college, there was a split in our church. Um, pretty ugly, we'll get into that. It resulted in my parents, amongst others, forming a new church, a Seventh-day Adventist church within a conference. And they wanted that this church would, uh, would preach the truth that their children can learn and live by. And so they would bring in, you know, speakers who, who taught us the truth. And that was the first time I heard the Bible come alive. I mean, the Bible is just to me, it was just felt on the Sabbath school felt board. That's all it was. It wasn't real. It wasn't heartwarming. It, it just, you know. But that was the first time I heard the Bible come alive, prophecy come alive. Then I started hearing about this term, medical, who wants to finish it? Missionary work. And I heard that for the first time. I thought, what's that? And, and then I heard the, you know, different individuals come and they're talking about medical missionary work. And, and specifically, they start talking about it in the context of prophecy. And in the last days, and then more specifically, in the days we're living in right now. And I'm like, hold on. The Bible, there, it, it matters now? You know, I'm thinking it's just past stories. I'm not thinking there's stuff that's unraveling right now in our lifetimes. And that, like, blew my mind. And, and then what blew my mind is that God was, God designed a way to, to take the gospel to the world and essentially to end all suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, analyzing this whole thing. Okay, everything comes up to money, right? And the more I started learning about the Bible, the more I started hearing about heaven, and then I learned something that was a pivotal point in my life. All the currencies in the world, or most of them anyway, they're weighed against gold, mm -hmm. standard, right? And, and there was a mind look, this will be super simple for you all, but this was mind blowing for me when I found out that in heaven, gold is asphalt. Right? <laughs> yes! <laughs> and that was mind blowing to me. I know it sounds so simple for you, but that was life altering for me. Because I'm like, wait a minute, everything I'm doing 
I'm busting my back over here, trying to get all of the right things so that the world will see me a certain way, so I can have a status and the money and do what, whatever I want to bring myself happiness. But here's a guy who has it all, who has no happiness. And everything that he worked for amounts to asphalt. Mm. Mm. Yes. And God speaks in my heart saying, I have something better. Amen. Amen. I felt this calling to medical missionary work. All right, now the story started. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> really and truly, there is a whole other chapter to this, but I don't, yeah, I don't have time to get into it. But um, long story short, I read a book. Long story short, um, I, I I felt. Like I started asking God, God, what do I do? I started having these new experiences with God. I started praying. I started studying the Word. I wanted to know this for myself. I heard about medical missionary work, and I heard about the Sunday Law and all this stuff. So I had this brilliant idea. Here's my 17-year-old brilliant idea. I, I'm going to find a medical missionary program. I'm going to take a semester off, take that medical missionary program, so I can have that as something to fall back on. That's what we do in college, right? When you're in college, you, 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 want, a, you want a degree so you can fall back on it. And something doesn't go your way, not the way you plan. So, so I said, let me get this medical missionary thing under my belt. So when the Sunday law comes, I'm good. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'll just make all the money, do, all, do whatever I want. And then when the Sunday law comes, I'll just fall back on medical missionary stuff. So. Mm. And so I, I started looking for a program and uh, I had my, my heart bent on, on uh, going to meet ministries, actually, and, uh, <laughs> which I praise God for that ministry. Um, Thomas Jackson's a great blessing, and, and others as well, and has become a good friend. And, and, but at that time, I was, I was bent on, on going to meet ministries, and, and uh, long story short, I went to a GYC. Now, some of you have heard this one. Went to a GYC, and... Um, and I got separated, my best friend and I, we got separated from our group of people. And how many of you have been to a GYC or some kind of, yeah, so, you know, there's a room full of people at meal times, and they have these people with the flags, you know, and they flag you like cattle <laughs> to where you're gonna feed. <laughs> and so they, they, they were like, there's, there's these two spots that are open all the way in the back. So I said, okay, let me go. And so my, my friend and I, we, we went and, and we, we approached this table and skirt people. <laughs> I'm like, there are these ladies wearing skirts, long skirts. And you know, with my history, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> like, I don't know what we're getting into here. We sit down. I'm very thankful for one of those skirt people. Because uh, one of them was a worker right here. Amen. Uh, some of you may know Elizabeth Bautista, I was sitting right next to her. And, uh, and she asked me the question, so what do you, what do, you do, what do you do, and whatever, and, uh, and I said, uh, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this in school, but I'm really thinking about this medical missionary thing. I'm thinking of it like a degree in college, you know? So I'm like, yeah, I'm really thinking about doing maybe this medical missionary thing. But I really don't know how it, how it's gonna happen. I don't have any money to do this. Poor college student. And she said, "We have a program." I'm like, what? <laughs> we have a program, yeah. And I was like, "Yeah, but uh, you know, we have a work study option." <laughs> I couldn't believe it. We exchanged information on the way back from GYC. We're driving, actually, because we drove from Maryland all the way to Houston, which is where this was. And so we're driving back. Actually, we were passing through Tennessee at the time. I had T-Mobile, which means I had all bars and no places. <laughs> and as we're driving through Tennessee, and by the way, my phone, which I thought anyway was dead, yeah, as far as I remember, my phone was dead, and I had no signal. Driving through Tennessee, and all of a sudden my dead T Mobile phone starts ringing. I pick up the phone, it's Brother Lou Keith. <laughs> he wants to follow up with me. Our conversation was 
five seconds off. So I was like, what? Uh, th th thanks, my phone's died. I'll call you back. <laughs> but the Lord opened the door. As I was coming here, I remember, you know, and I ended up coming here. The night before I drove here, my father ended up in the hospital. Cardiac symptoms. He felt like he was dying, and he's telling me he's not going to be here tomorrow. Thinking, Lord, why now? Everything was fine. The car is packed, we're ready to go. My dad ends up in the ER. By the way, he didn't have a heart attack. There was no issue. I don't know what happened. It was weird. And we get into my little car. Some of you remember my little two door sports car. And we get in that thing and we start driving, making the trip from Maryland down here to the woods. As I'm driving, suddenly I get bronchitis. And so here I am now, and I said, my dad and I looked at each other and said, we think this is the right way we're going. <laughs> and so here I am having an asthma attack, bronchitis. I'm driving now. We put on the nebulizer. You know what a nebulizer is? Yes. It's a little compressor yes. and it has like a mask and there's medicine flowing through it. So I'm sitting here on the nebulizer trapping. You know? <laughs> My dad's sitting here looking like a cardiac patient. I'm sitting here looking. And as we're driving, we're coming down the highway and it seemed like everything was against me coming here. And as I'm driving, guess what? You would think that's bad enough. And I'm sorry, I'm kicking you from suffering. Traffic came to a standstill. What happened? A semi-truck in front of us carrying hazardous material suddenly flipped and spilled hazardous material across the entire interstate and we could not move. We stopped. We had to sit there waiting for it. So just things like this, you know? Things like this would happen. And I knew that God was calling me to something that's different. Mm -hmm. I get here, I start going, long story short, I get here, and uh, Darlene's teaching the class. I'm feeling convicted about so many things in my life. God is doing heart surgery on me. And I believe he still does heart surgery here. All right. Mm -hmm. He still does. And, uh, and I asked Darlene, said, Darlene, would it be okay if I stayed? Because remember, I only want to take one semester off, so that's only about three months. I said, Darlene, would it be okay if I stayed for the rest of the program? And the Lord told me right there, this is your life work. Mm -hmm. Amen. I've called you to do this for the rest of your life. I left my scholarship. I left my whatever, worldly aspirations. I prayed a prayer. I said, Lord, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. But you have to open the doors and I don't know what I'm doing. Amen. And as I studied the word, I saw that medical missionary was the path. As I looked at Providence, I see the doors opening. You remember those things we studied today? Mm -hmm. I see the doors opening. I see a hindrance from the enemy. And I knew that my God was leading me to a new phase of life. Amen. I don't have time to get into all the miracle stories that happened along the way, but this was the first step for me. Amen. And when I came here to this very ground, it was the first time that I asked Jesus to be my friend. Amen. He's been more than a friend since. Amen. He's been a friend to me when I wasn't a friend to him. There she is. But all along, his hand was guiding. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. I'm thankful that God hasn't given up on me. Amen. 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 Where I am now, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but we're out of time. But uh, after here, the Lord led me through a number of things. I was further studying after I left here. I didn't know what to do. Tried different things, failed. Because the Lord was opening and closing doors. Sometimes we see a closed door as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. I had so many closed doors after here. And I'm thinking, Lord, why did you send me to this if I have nothing to do with it? 
And that's something people will ask you, by the way. When you get into medical mission work, they'll say, oh, so how are you going to provide? <laughs> they'll say, oh, so, what, uh, so are you going to go back to school after that? Or so what can you do with that? You know, these are the questions people ask, not understanding that our God has more resources than all the billionaires Amen. combined. Amen. Right? And he will provide for our need. I wish I could tell you all the miracle stories of when I was in the mission field. I remember having a broken windshield once. Gravel hit my car, broke the windshield, $400. Mm -hmm. And I remember, is that Lord, I don't have the money to fix this, but I'm working for you. And I'm gonna go with this, go on with this mission trip and I'll just leave it with you. If you think that I need a new windshield, I'll leave that with you. Mm -hmm. I came back from my mission trip a month later and I find a white envelope in my room with the exact dollar amount. I didn't tell a soul on the planet, I didn't tell my parents, I didn't tell anyone how much I needed. I didn't even tell them that there was a need. This happened twice. The Lord has taken care of me. No, I'm not a millionaire. I'm not even a thousandaire. <laughs> my dad used to say, if you have my money, you'd be poor. If you have my blessings, you'd be rich. God led me from here as I studied. More I'm studying about the sanitary work. I started looking around, I started reading about different things, and I started feeling impressed that God wanted me to work as a physician. And that was a challenge for me because I hated my doctor growing up. <laughs> I was not a very uh, likable person. And I had family members who were doctors, and I didn't particularly look up to them either. And uh, that was the last thing I wanted to do was anything medical, right? And so I'm like, you know, I, was, I was good with other things. I wasn't interested in anything medical. And plus, believe it or not, I'm actually an introvert. So <laughs> it's hard for me to you know, uh, interact with people. And so uh, but I felt like God was calling me to that. And I looked around at our sanitariums and I saw that most of our physicians were elderly, dead, or dying. Mercy. And uh, they were literally giving their lives for the gospel, but there were no young men and women taking up the yes. work. Yes. Mm. And, and I was so conflicted because as I'm reading, I also find that God has a method in medicine. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's diametrically opposed to what the world has to offer as a yes. I was very conflicted. So when, when, if you've ever wrestled with that question, Lord, what do you want me to do? I really wrestled with that. But God ordained another way for me. And I don't have time to get into it. <laughs> but long story short, God did uh, give me the opportunity. He set up my educational pathway. He put me through different circumstances that gave me the skills that I needed so that finally when I had an opportunity to study uh, medicine and I had the opportunity to learn under a godly physician who mentored me and said, whatever you don't know, I'll teach you. Mm. And I had the opportunity, long story short, I wouldn't keep saying that and the story gets longer. Okay. So I saying that. But I, I ended up going to UG Pines Institute. How many of you have heard of UG Pines Institute? I went to UG Pines Institute because I, I looked at the curriculum, which is the Sister Institute of Wildwood. I'm very familiar with Wildwood, but not so much UG Pines. But I looked at the curriculum and I said, that's what every physician should learn. Learn the natural things. Therapeutic nutrition, apology, all this stuff, right? I said, wow, this is brilliant. This is what everyone should be learning. And I, by the way, had done a tour. I went through and I actually sat in on classes in different medical schools in different parts of the country. And you know what I didn't find? God's method. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to learn at UG Pines Institute. And Mark Sandoval, he was uh, president medical director at that time, my friend. And we, we founded the Lifestyle Practitioner Program for individuals 
who can study medicine and practice within God's methods. And it's unfortunate that that exists because this really should be in all of our medical schools. But that's one thing I'm working on right now is a project to start a new college of medical medicine. That's a little top secret. <laughs> um, and so I've been at UG Pines now for the last nine years. And I wish I could get into all the details of the challenges in ministry, just to be real with you. you know. I came, I went to learn. I was brought onto the medical staff and now in administration as well. And I learned something that when you're in full-time ministry, it does not, now listen to this carefully, I know it's hot in here, I know I've been long with I apologize, but don't miss this part. When you're in full-time ministry, you with me? Mm -hmm. All right, can't read mine, so I don't know. It does not make you immune to the attacks of Satan. Amen. 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 True. Say it again. True. When you're involved in full-time ministry, it does not make you immune from the attacks of Satan. Nay, I would say it makes them more intense. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and that's because God has a work for you to do. And Satan knows our weakest most basic points that we will fall on. He knows you. Satan knows you. I'm, I'm not glorifying him, but just, we gotta know our enemy, right? Yes. Satan knows you and your weaknesses better than you do. Yes. True. True. Satan knows my weaknesses better than I do. But I'm so thankful that God knows me even more. Yes. 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 And when I'm weak, Yes. And his strength yes. is made perfect, yes. not after my weakness, right? Yes. I don't have to make myself, I can't make myself strong. His strength is perfect in my weakest point. God can do for me more than what I can do for myself. And challenges in ministry, there will always be people issues and money issues. Mm -hmm. But God has been faithful. Mm -hmm. Satan knows how to discourage us. And believe me, he did that to me many times. I, I'll say, I allowed him to. Mm -hmm. Satan will cause you to go into depression. Mm -hmm. And he got me a few times. Satan will allow you to slack on your lifestyle that you know God has called you to do. Mm -hmm. He'll do anything to shake you from the truth. Yes. Yes. And I was this close to walking away from everything that God called me to do. Mm -hmm.
headaches, I'm tired, I would get up from bed, I would have these headaches, and I was just like, what's going on with me? I thought I was sick, I'm taking my vitamin D. And I'm like, something's wrong. And then the, the you know, the, the clinical brain took, took over and was like, oh wait, you know what this is. It's depression. And I sent out a prayer to God in that moment I realized it. I said, Lord, I can't help myself. But Lord, I have no way of pulling myself out of this. I need a miracle. Right? And so, uh, God sent a miracle. I was in bed, because remember, I would, I would be sleepy all the time and headaches. So I would go to bed. You know, there was one time I slept for like four days straight. That's how bad it was. Mm -hmm. I remember going to bed, and I, after I prayed this prayer, Lord, I need your help. I know what this is, and I feel totally helpless. Help me, Lord. I went to bed, and I remember, I, I, get, I got in the bed, and all of a sudden I felt something. What is that? And I felt another thing. Then I realized something was biting me in my bed. Open the covers, covered in ants. <laughs> now, there was no food in my room or anything like that. I don't know where they came from, but they decided that they wanted Indian food today. <laughs> so, so I was, I was angry, I was upset, and I got up and I threw the covers off, and guess what I did? No, I went for a walk. <laughs> I went out and I went for a walk in the fresh air and sunshine and God's natural remedies were blessing to me. And then I would get these headaches, and again I would go back to bed, and guess what happened? Yes. Again, and this is after cleaning them up, vacuuming them, putting out traps, eradicating them. Ants, again, I don't know where they came from. And you know what I did? Go for it. I threw it in a for a while. There's a verse. Go to the ant, thou slugger. Well, God sent the ant to the slugger. <laughs> But the Lord got me out of it. Amen. And he did more than that. He pulled me out of that experience. Amen. He reminded me of my value in him and how much he loved me. I share that not because, uh, yeah, you know, I really hate sharing this story, but I share that just to be real with you. I'm trying to love all of you here. It doesn't matter if you're in leadership or whatever you're in. As a human, you're not immune. Yeah. But that's why we're counseled to what? Who remembers? Put on the armor of God. And it must be done how often? Yeah. How many of you put on your clothes yesterday? <laughs> Alright, well, since you put on your clothes yesterday, you don't have to put it on today, right? <laughs> we're in grave danger when we leave our armor behind. Armor is important to me because my name means brave knight. Mm -hmm. And I believe God has called not only me but you. Here, I'll close with this quote. I'll close with this quote. Uh, where is it? There it is. Wait. All right. Satan has taken advantage of the weakness of humanity, and he will still work in the same way. Whenever one is encompassed with clouds, perplexed by circumstances, or afflicted by poverty or distress, Satan is at hand to tempt and annoy. He attacks our what? Weak. Our weak points of character. He seeks to shake our confidence in God, who suffers such a condition of things to exist. We are tempted to distrust God, to question His love. Often the tempter comes to us as he came to Christ, arraying before us our weaknesses and infirmities. He hopes, I know, sorry, this is hard to read. He hopes to discourage the soul and to break our hold on God. Then he is sure of his prey. If we would meet him as Jesus did, we should escape many a defeat. By parlaying with the enemy, we give him an advantage. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, 
to stand. Here's my last one. Amid perplexity and trial, discouragement and suffering, with the devotion of a martyr and the courage of a Absolutely. Hero. Don't be like me. God needs a you. Okay? With the devotion of a martyr and the courage of a hero, he is to hold fast to the hand that never lets go, saying, I will not fail nor be discouraged. Can we say that together? I will not fail nor be discouraged. One more time. I will not fail nor be discouraged. He must be a close Bible student and should be often in prayer. If before talking with others, he will seek help from above, he may be assured that angels of heaven will be with him. Amen. At times he may yearn for human sympathy. That's okay, Jesus did too. But in his loneliness, he may find comfort and encouragement through communion with God. Amen. Let him be cheered by the words of the Savior, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. From this divine companion, capital C, he will receive instruction in the science of soul saving. Friends, God has a work for you to do. God knows it. The angels know it. Satan even knows it. But do you know it? Don't waste your life on anything less than what God has for you. That's my loving counsel, if I may, unsolicited counsel. Don't waste your life on anything less than what God has planned for you. Amen. And with that, let's pray. My Father in heaven, Lord, I am so thankful that you haven't given up on me. And I know you haven't given up on anyone here. As I read this morning, that while we were yet sinners, that Jesus died for me and for all of us. Father, I, I'm sure there is someone struggling here in this room. I don't know, I don't read hearts, but you do. And I just ask that you would draw near to that person. I ask that you would also draw near to the leaders in this room. And the leaders not in this room because they're so busy doing all of this. Lord, we ask that you would give us the courage to put on the whole armor every day. To not feel comfortable leaving until we know Jesus is coming with us. Lord, maybe someone's struggling with not knowing what to do with their life. I ask that you would make it clear as you did for me. Help them to be encouraged when the doors open and help them to be encouraged when the doors close. And I thank you, Father, for being able to use dust to do your great work. Bless us as we enjoy the rest of the Sabbath with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.